Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Derek Steer. I'm the manager of data science and performance improvement for Lakeland Regional Health. Um, with me today is uh, Ray Reddy. Uh, he's our, our lead data scientist, and we're here to talk to you today about how we use Tableau to increase, ac increase patient access by improving emergency department throughput in our hospital, and how that acted as kind of like an initial case study, for a phase one deployment, if you will, uh, and how that allowed us to undergo a complete you know, analytic transformation at Lakeland Regional Health. So it's, pretty, pr it's been a, you know, a fun journey, and I'm excited to share our story with you today. So there's Ray and I. Can everyone hear me okay? But, all right, cool. Uh, first, a little bit about uh, Lakeland Regional Health. Uh, as you can see, you know, we're about uh, 3,000 miles away, you know, 45 hours in current traffic, about 46 hours, um, about a six-hour flight. So I'm still jet-lagged, um, waking up at 4 a.m. every morning just because I'm used to it, apparently. Um, but that's not normal for me, so I'm typically not a morning person. So when I'm waking up at 4 a.m. local time, it's completely disheartening. Um, but I'll, I'll get through it, I'm sure. Um, just show of hands, how many, how many healthcare professionals are in here today, just so I kind of avoid jargon or use it liberally, okay. Um, so a little bit about Lakeland Regional. Uh, we're the busiest single site emergency room in Florida, seeing about 200,000 visits a year. Uh, we're a large community, uh, not-for-profit hospital, about 851 licensed beds, about 5,000 employees, about 120 of which are employed physicians. The rest of our physicians are, you know, they're, they belong to a clinic um, literally right down the street from us. Um, so our journey started back in uh, 2011. Uh, we got a new CEO, and the, you know, anyone who works for a hospital knows that's a, a huge change. The previous CEO, I think, had been there for like 25 years. Um, she was very progressive, very data-driven. Um, she had an industrial engineering background. Uh, and she set, I think in the first nine months, a new strategic vision uh, for the hospital. Uh, and that, uh, that vision was to really drive us to become one of the 100 top hospitals in the nation. Uh, up until this point, we had been a very solid, above average hospital. Um, so we wanted to start in the emergency room, you know, fix the front door and, and the rest will follow. Um, you know, the, the idea was, if, if, you know, fix the front door, everything else will follow. Um, our, our CEO is very focused on quality, and she believes the finances will follow that. If we have the quality, you know, the money will follow. Uh, so the idea, start in the emergency room and give autonomy to the leader in charge, uh, who's ultimately responsible for, for making that, uh, that change. Uh, and that was our AVP of, of clinical operations. Uh, and it started by just setting a singular goal. Uh, and that goal was to make sure 80% of patients were seen and discharged uh, from the emergency department or admitted to an observation or inpatient bed uh, within three hours and to hit that goal within two years. Um, so everyone in the entire organization uh, really you know, galvanized around that goal. We we're, were all focused on, hey, now you could ask anybody, and that was, you know, that was the number one goal. What's funny is that setting this goal was you know, probably I don't know, three years ahead of um, you know, Medicare's regulations. They have all these like pending metrics. Um, so we knew we wanted to have that, that ED throughput in place, but it wasn't anything that was required at that point. So up until that point, again, with being a solid above average hospital, you know, it was kind of by the book, whatever CMS, um, you know, Medicare dictated, like we made sure we were in compliance with those things. Um, now we were setting something that wasn't required, uh, but it, you know, it should really help us become a better hospital. Um, so, you know, our emergency room was typical. Uh, it was overcrowded, it was chaotic. You know, we had dissatisfi dissatisfied patients, families, and staff. There was a perception of poor care. Uh, we had several boarders. You know, there were patients in hallways often. Um, we had code purples where, you know, basically our ED was too full. We had to turn patients away because we just literally couldn't accept any more patients. Um, what that translated to was about 10,000 people uh, that would present in the ED uh, and they'd leave without being seen. Um, so just in terms of access to care, these were people that were seeking care, but we had to literally turn them away. Um, at that point in time, about 40% of our patients were in and out of the ER in less than three hours. And about 20% of patients were spending at least six and a half hours in the emergency room. Uh, I'm sure, show of hands, how many people have gone to the emergency room before? You know, almost everybody. And it's a scary, horrible time. I mean, if you're a, a patient going through that type of crisis, um, you want to be sure when you go through that process that you can get in and out of there 
um, confidently, uh, safely, securely into the appropriate care location, whether that be home or into an inpatient bed. So having six and a half hours of that emergency time is, is scary. Um, basically, we need to understand what was causing these bottlenecks, uh, both from a you know, why as well as a what. Uh, at the time, we didn't have a lot of metrics around what those different timestamps look like. Is it the time from admission to when a, a physician is seen? Uh, is it the time from when a physician is seen to when they're, put in a, you know, when they're uh, dispositioned, you know, when they're what is determined if they're going to go home or not? Or is it the time from disposition to when they actually go home or are sent to a bed? Uh, there's lots of different factors that can, you know, that can um, contribute to the length of stay in an emergency room. So what do we do? You know, we had no real business intelligence solution at the time. Uh, there was no database, so to speak. We had just gone up with Cerner, our EHR. Uh, IT was, was you know, focused on refining and, and rolling that out to make sure we met the, the meaningful use deadlines. Uh, all we had were text files coming out of Cerner, large text files on a monthly basis, and that was it. So, so what do you do? You know, what, what did anyone do with, with that type of situation? Um, we turned to Excel. So uh, we started, you know, pulling in text files, you know, text to columns, uh, parsing these things out, creating, you know, a database, which is, you know, just a massive Excel file in this situation. Uh, and what happened? Uh, we put out some tabular reports, you know, basically said, here are the numbers, here's what they are, once we identified the metrics. Uh, but it really didn't answer why. And, uh, you know, because we're looking at so much data, uh, you know, we were probably looking at a year and a half's worth of data, eventually we ran into problems with Excel. So we had these massive files, and we started running into problems. Things I'm sure you've all experienced before. <laughs> Very frustrating. You know, so what do we do? So I turned to Ray. I think Ray had been with us for about a year and a half at that point. Uh, we had just undergone a major crystal deployment, very exciting stuff. Um, again, you know, my background, I came from banking. Uh, Ray had his own um, IT consulting company, so both of us, you know, were familiar with, with BI tools and data, you know, data warehouse concepts, and we felt like we were in the dark ages. Um, so, you know, what do we do? You know, we need a tool that will allow our leaders to see and understand their data. You know, Ray, what are we gonna do? Um, he had a solution. So he had used it on a, on a previous engagement, and um, you know, he kind of said, well, you know, try this Tableau tool out. Let's, let's see what we can do. So we were literally trying to get our monthly reports out, and we couldn't because Excel was blowing up. Uh, so you know, we, we bought some time. We bought about two weeks um, to come up with a solution and get just, just to get the report out. Uh, so we leveraged the 14-day trial. Uh, you know, we, we checked it out, validated that you know, they met the, the functional requirements. Uh, which is basically, you know, can we get the report out? Uh, we built a few workbooks. Um, you know, we deployed the reader to our AVP of clinical operations, and we started building TWBX files and putting those dashboards out on a SharePoint site where they could access them. And they were impressed. They liked it. They could drill around faster than, than they could in Excel. There were things that they could do you know, with, with filtering that they couldn't do before. Uh, so we went ahead and purchased Tableau Desktop, just one license, uh, bought it on my credit card, you know, in line with purchasing policies that existed, so we didn't have to go through like a long capital process for, you know, $120,000, $150,000 purchase. We just wanted something that we could use today as kind of a proof of concept. Um, and it was a success. So we rebuilt all the existing reports, and what we found is that all that time that we were spending processing, we actually had this Excel file called uh, ED File Prepper. And it was a, basically you had to take this, you know, your text file, load it into this, you know, this prepper file, run it through a series of macros, take the output and append it into another file because if you left it in the first file, the file got too big and you'd always run out of memory. It's crazy. Um, and I'm thinking people, you know, everywhere have experienced that. So it was, it was just completely ludicrous. Um, and at that, you know, at that point, what we found is, you know, our highly skilled analysts were taking all this time processing we, d we didn't have enough time to analyze. And what we, what, where we ended up was we had time to analyze the data. We could actually look at data and answer the question why, which is what people want to know. They don't want to know what. They want to know why, when, where, how. Um, so at this point, 
let me turn it over to Ray and he'll kind of walk you through some of the stuff that he built uh, once, we were, once we were up and running. Thanks, Derek. That great intro and for buying Tableau. I pre appreciate that. Made yeah. my life much better. Yeah, mine too. So um, as, as Derek said, we had these Excel files with cross tabs and a lot of data that was aggregated you know, somewhat statically. Um, they were really hard to read, um, really difficult to understand, and you really couldn't get a whole lot of insight out of them. So I'm going to switch over to Tableau and show you some of the stuff that we built. Um, in initially, we built line graphs, bar graphs, you know, all kinds of different ways to look at our data in Tableau. Um, but we kept getting asked, um, why did we fail to meet our goal on this particular day? What, what, what happened? So all those aggregations, like, still weren't, you know, they, 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 they really couldn't answer that. But Tableau allowed us to build views like this. So we could take all of that data that was coming from our electronic health record um, and build a Gantt bar chart that would show all of those timestamps, um, door in to door out, triage complete to room, room to physician, door in to triage complete, physician to dispo, dispo to door out. And we could sort this different ways. We could filter it um, to you know, look at um, where people perceive that there might be problems. Um, but you know, one thing that we could do with it is if this particular day they you know, miserably failed to hit that three hour goal, well, we could just go scrolling through it and look to see, you know, what might have went wrong. And we could start to pick up, I mean, ta Tableau is really awesome in that you can visually start seeing, like, whoa, what's going on here? Uh, triage complete to room, you know, is getting longer. Way back up, up here, um, it was just minutes to get people from tri triage to complete to room. But certain times of the day, um, not so much. So, you know, now we could go in and we could see, you know, say, well, wh well why, why is that? We could brainstorm, you know, think of different things. Um, and then what, what we would do is um, we might um, drill into a particular example he here. Um, let's grab this one here. Drill in and get some more information, you know, look at labs, radiology orders, um, you know, you know what, what's going on. Um, and then move to things like blending that encounter level visit data with staffing data coming out of another system. You know, really simply, quickly, Tableau would, would let us take those two data sets, we could blend them. What, what you're looking at here is the hourly uh, arrivals in the ED on a p particular day um, that um, we, 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 we wanted to look at, and then overlay staffing data and compute a, a ratio. And what we saw right off was arrivals start, you know, they start increasing and then they sort of plateau, but the EVS staffing, they, they were cutting back. Um, and they were staffed really high through the middle of the night. Um, well, what EVS does is they come in and they clean those, those rooms in the ER, prep them and make them ready for somebody new to, to come in. So when we saw that um, triage to room would start getting longer, well, one of the things that we found was um, staff cutbacks, you know, shifts ended um, and there were still a lot of patients arriving. Um, the rooms now couldn't be cleaned fast enough to keep up. Um, so we were able to sit down with the ED leadership, 
with EVS leadership, show them all this, um, and they could see it, and they believed it because, you know, now that we had it in Tableau and we could do this, you know, quickly, um, they just, you know, see, seeing is be, be, believing. They, they now could accept it and say, yeah, that, that doesn't look right. Let's fix that. Um, another thing that, um, that we did was, um, you know, the largest time component um, in the ED process is physician assigned to dispo. Um, back on that Gantt bar chart, that was that red segment that you know pretty much dominated everything. That's a really tricky time component because there's a lot of stuff going on. There's 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 labs being ordered. There's tests being done in 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 radiology. Um, you know, on and on and on. So we we needed a way to be able to illustrate to the physician group in our e ER, um, you know, what types of physician pra practice would yield meeting the three-hour goal, and then, you know, which ones um, might, could improve somewhat. So in, in this view, we just use simple bar charts for each of these metrics, um, and we could come in here and we could see well, who, who is that physician? Click on that. It's a really small bar. You know, um, the physician name's bl 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 blinded, but who is that doctor and why is he so good? Um, you can see that um, room assigned to physician assigned, he's number two. Um, he's number two here, physician assigned to dispo. And then we also built metrics around last order complete um, to dispo. So, you know, looking at when those lab orders end, when those radiology orders end, and then when is he making that, that decision to either admit them or send them home. Um, the, and, and then in some other metrics, um, even though he's, you know, number one, um, he's kind of in the middle of the pack over here for lab order per percentage. Um, CT order percentage, um, you know, so sometimes you, you would find, let's just randomly grab somebody here, um, and so, you know, you can, you, you, you can see where they're doing good and where they could, you know, use some improvement. Um, and this was built in ta Tableau with just out-of-the-box functionality. Um, you know, all of these bar charts are linked through um, a hi highlight action um, that just takes all of those metrics and links them up so that you can do what I was demonstrating. You can click on, you know, any bar or a particular physician. And our leadership group could then sit down um, because everything's bl blinded. They don't, you know, they know their bar but they really don't know who else, you know, the other bars are. And that would spur competition. You know, well, geez, if I'm, you know, dead last, I don't want to be there. I want to move, um, you know, up in, in that rank. Um, all right, so I'm going to flip back over to the PowerPoint. Those are just some of the uh, views that we built there. If we have time, we may show a few more um, at the end. So as you saw, you know, some, some of the other things um, that we found, uh, uh, initially we placed patients um, based on their acuity. We had you know, different levels of acuity in the ED. So, you know, if you were a tra trauma, you would go to this area and these beds. If you were, you know, an intermediate care, you might go over here. But um, what, what we found as we looked through data is that people don't come in based on acuity. They come to the ED, they come, you know, you might get all kinds of patients coming in at all different times. It's just a, a big mix. So we, we switched to a, a model based on those findings 
um, to where there's a physician who's responsible for a block of beds, nine to ten beds, um, and a nursing staff that, you know, is in that pod, and they, they work that pod, and they get fed, you know, round robin, whoever comes in, they hit those different pods. Um, we found with our, um, our lab testing, um, we were able to make gains through our, um, a, a lab automation pro project, um, as, as well as um, in radiology, um, as we looked through data, a, a, a large population that, you know, existed that had CT scans, they pretty much never met the goal. Um, you know, so, you know, people had kind of said, well, we just have to write them off as, you know, it's just, just not going to happen. Well, we were able to show data and work with the radiology group along with the, the, the ED um, physicians, and they came up with um, shortening drink times, rearranging some staffing, and, you know, we were able to get about half of our, our CT scan pa pa patients to hit that goal, um, where before pretty much none of them did. So we, we, we re really began to see change begin to happen. That dreaded word that nobody really likes to have things change, but it really started to become something that as we saw success, we started liking it. Um, and our physician um, t teams in the ED and our AVP and director, um, they you know, began to just passionately embrace, looking for every opportunity that they could to make people's lives better, to help them get through the ED faster um, so that they could get the tre treatment that they ne needed um, you know, get that start started as quickly as we can, so nobody's waiting. Um, and then the 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 strange thing was, as we had tab tableau, um, our meetings where we would go meet and they would tell me what they needed to see, and then I'd go back and I'd build it. They started turning into like two workshops where, for two hours, we would sit there and I would they would just talk to me and I would build stuff, just sitting there building it, showing them. They would get answers right away. They'd go back and call their managers in and start making, you know, almost instant cha change sometimes. Um, and then I started to, like, it was weird. I, I started to think like they did because I was able to converse with them um, and their strategies and their thought pro processes, I, I didn't really know about an ER, like I had no clue what went on there. But the more that we did that, um, I became a better analyst um, by being able to understand how they thought. And then I'd go back when I, you know, kind of in a spare moment, which there aren't very many of those, but um, I, I would just, I'd be like, hmm, you know, I bet they're wondering about this. And I'd build something. And then our next meeting, I'd just start off and show them, hey, look at what I built. Um, you think this would be helpful. And so one ex ex example of that um, was um, we were having difficulty um, at certain transition times, like right around se 7 a.m. to where we couldn't meet our goals. And at, at, as you can see here, uh, again, this is um, – oh, there's my mouse – um, uh, rival rates as a, a, a ratio uh, per physician. So um, what we noticed was because our shifts, when they started and when certain pods opened, um, our physician ratios to arrivals for just a two-hour window were a little bit off, and the percentage meeting goal would start to, to, to fall. And then um, you know, there's this um, theory called uh, perturbation theory, which is big in traffic control. And, you know, essentially what it is is 
um, if, if things start getting out of control, waves of disruption, you know, kind of filter on through your process. So because of this instance, things would start to back up in the ED and it would just, you know, spiral through the day. And, and you can see here our per per percentage meeting goal would drop, 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 and then plateau. Um, you know, some of that was a, f a function of just the huge number of uh, rivals, but in Tableau, we were able to build this analytic and create parameters for each of the pod starts, start times. And then you could just move those start times around and you could see these bars um, shift up and down to you know, just explore what would those ratios look like. And so you could adjust that and then settle on a, a staggered start time like we have here where we made sure that we didn't impact any of these later hours that you know when we move these uh, around you know it's just simple s something simple like this um, you can sit down and show the executive leadership um, you know things and they you know once they see it um, they can make decisions off of it so we got really close at this point you know we were nearing our goal that come from? You left that in, huh? <laughs> we, 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 we put that in there just to see if the, uh, the Tableau people review in our presentation would comment on it, but I guess we they left did. it in. They, so we just left, yeah, All right. we left that in there. Fair enough. So. All right. So, you know, in addition to, to using Tableau for analysis, uh, you know, one of the really neat things we found we could do with all this extra, you know, all these extra visual analytics is we found we could tell a really compelling story. So our chief operating officer approached us about wanting to put together a presentation to our board of directors. And what she had in mind you know, was, was good. It was a bar chart by quarter showing you know, percent meeting the three hour goal for the last you know, 15 months. Um, you know, okay, like yeah, we, we can do that in probably 10 minutes, that's, that's fine. Um, but with this being, you know, ba basically we recognize an opportunity here. You know, if we could show to the board and to our executive team what visual analytics could do, not just from an analysis standpoint, but in terms of telling a story, you know, we're hoping we could get some buy-in and continue the momentum that we had with the ED project. So at this point, the project was kind of wrapping up. Um, we had success. We had one desktop license. Uh, we wanted more. We wanted, you know, we wanted it to, to go wild. So, you know, I kind of challenged Ray, and we had this, this cool... Uh, analytic that we had used very early on and it basically you know was a histogram showing the you know the number of patients that were coming through in um, in 15 minute buckets and uh, you can see the green ones met the goal and the yellow ones didn't so we had this idea we kind of brainstormed and came up with this concept of an animated histogram and um, just kind of turned Ray loose on it and it was really cool it was the first time an analyst had presented to the board um, the chief operating officer really liked what, what Ray put together, so she invited him to present before the board of directors. And um, you know, I'm, I'm just going to let you know if you if you want to share. Sure. Yeah, I was share the story. Yeah, I was blown away, and that you know that was a, a real honor. So we um, we thought you know Tableau it can do more than just analyze data, visualize things. You know, this was prior to storyboards, but I mean even back then you could build a dashboard and Tableau had this really neat um, page filter. I don't know if you ever noticed it, um, but you can drag date times up there or you know, sometimes categorical fields and you can play them and watch your animation change. So we built a dashboard that combined a histogram um, and um, what I'm gonna call a bar plot because it's not a line but um, here is, is the, the ED volume by month. Um, so when I click into this and play it, it'll tell the story and I don't really have to you know, do anything but set the stage. Um, explain to them that the green bars represent you know, all the patients that meet the three hour goal and the gold bars um, are all of those who aren't. And you can see there's a lot of gold. 
in this histogram. Um, and then, you know, keep your eye out for these gray historical trailing marks that Tableau will start to show um, as we play through this. The red line you can kind of see is our median at that point in time. Yeah. So 218 minutes at that point. So here, here's those gray marks, and you know we've just implemented our first major operational change. Um, there's a lot of little stuff going on, but you know, but we'll just keep play, playing this. And I would stop as you know each of these would pop up, and I'd just kind of you know give them a little um, explanation about you know what we did and. Um, and then move on. And you can see that gray area, you know, just growing, and the green area is increasing. And all while all of this, you know, shifting is happening, our volumes in the ER are continuing to cl climb. I mean, they're just growing, growing, growing. One, you know, unexpected result, or not really unexpected. I mean, everybody kind of thought it was going to happen, but as we got better, people started, com you know, coming. More people, more people, and um, not sure Bells where they were going. Yeah. What's that? Hmm? Oh. Um, so we hit the end, you know, we had went from a little less than 40% being able to meet that goal to over 80%, and we've sustained that. Um, we have not dropped below 80% um, since November of 2012. Uh, last month, um, it was about 81.9%, and it fluctuates. Um, but um, so we kind of threw this in. Um, you know, this was a cumulative savings of time that directly impacted each and every pa patient that came through our ED, which, you know, wh one way that you can think about this is that everybody who came through could now be home quicker with enough time to watch a feature-length film with their family instead of being stuck at the hospital, you know, being just you know, hating life. Um, you know, it's much better to be home than in the hospital. Or admitted versus in the emergency room where you don't really know True. which way you're going to go. But this was a really compelling story, and the board loved it. And it's not letting me break out. Everything we expected to happen when we, you know, when we kind of win with that strategy happened, people came up to Ray and they were just like, hey, can you do this for radiology? You know, hey, can you do this for lab? Hey, can you do this for all, all sorts of different areas? Um, so, which is exciting. You know why? I I just couldn't help myself. You know, and I came 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 up with this, making a mountain out of a molehill. Because I just I like pr proving old cl cliches wrong. And in this instance. Um, it was just fitting to be able to say that, you know, we, we, I mean, this literally to me looked like a mountain. Um, we, we were doing right by our patients and um, they were getting the care that they needed. Um, and, um, you know, all of this, except for these arrows and stuff, I'm not sure where those came from, was brought, made possible by Tableau. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Derek um, and uh, cool. Thank you, Ray. You can share so yeah, some it was, more. It was, uh, it was really exciting. Like I said, we started seeing people coming in. They wanted more. Um, so we had this great story about our emergency room. Um, this is a, um, an excerpt taken from Truven Health Analytics 2014 Hunter Top Hospitals report. And basically, you know, what it shows, the, uh, the blue bar is us. Um, the, the green bar is what they have as the, um, they call it the, the benchmark median. 
uh, the yellow bar is the peer group median. And basically, the way they've set up their, their reporting par you know, paradigm is basically you have your, your benchmark hospitals that are part of the 100 top and everybody else. Um, so our goal was to be in that benchmark group, which there's been lots of studies, that are, I guess Truven has, has done a study. Uh, the whole point of their, their reporting system was to show that you know, using publicly reported data, uh, you could actually correlate you know, success in those metrics with better outcomes. Uh, so our, our CEO, again, being uh, very, very data-centric, really liked that rating system versus some of the others that rely more on reputation um, and, and perception. This was all cold, hard facts. So what, what this shows in this particular chart for these uh, five metrics, um, the desired direction is down. You want to be lower. Uh, and you can see in terms of uh, the number of minutes that a patient spends in the ED. Excuse me. Got to get some caffeine here. That 4 a.m. is killing me right now. Uh, as well as the time from <clears throat> when a physician would see you. Sorry. Give you some water. Thanks. Um, to when you'd be discharged. All, all of these timestamps are, are lower than not just national average, but um, those benchmark groups as well. So we're, we're, we're really setting a, a new standard. Uh, we're very excited about it. Uh, we've been recognized in Becker's in a, in a couple of different articles. Uh, I'm not going to read the quotes, but the gist of it was, was use data and act on your data. Uh, one of the things that, that really helped get this through, in addition to that multidisciplinary team, uh, that single goal was a tenacious leader um, that was not afraid to make changes. Thank you. Appreciate it. And using the, the data that we were showing, you know, she'd go back and make changes left and right. And some things wouldn't work, others would. But through tinkering, um, we were able to, to really improve access to care, reduce throughput, um, all the while maintaining things like patient satisfaction, safety, and quality. So where's that 15 million? So for people that are really focused on, on the bottom line, I know in, in the abstract I promised $15 million annually. So where's that 15 million? Um, basically, given 200,000 ED visits a year, starting off with a 5% rate of patients that were actually leaving without being seen, um, you know, ending at about half percent of patients leaving without being seen, uh, with an average reimbursement of about $1,700 uh, per patient, uh, what that translates to is about 9,000 visits that stay long enough to receive care. So these are patients that were leaving because they couldn't get care. Um, now they're receiving care. And that totals about $15 million a year. So now what? Well, we had our base case. We had our, um, we had our you know, demand increase. Um, so we need to undergo a, a major transformation. We need to take it from reporting and become analytics. Uh, so this was a slide that some of you probably saw last year. Um, it really resonated with our team. And we really wanted to get to the right side of this analytic, where we're exploring, analyzing, communicating, uh, monitoring performance, and, and predicting uh, the future. So again, historically, you know, we'd meet with the customers for an hour, take notes. They'd probably get out. You know, we'd probably get out of the meeting half an hour early. You know, we'd, we'd free up that time. Um, you know, we'd go back to our desk, work, knock it out. Um, you know, probably run into something weird, send an email for clarification, wait three or four days for them to email us back, work on something else, you know, get a response, make some adjustments to the report we built. Um, you know, email the report, you know, showing them what the, the customer wanted. Um, and then wait for that response, you know, well, you know, that's not quite what I want. Um, rinse and repeat. And that would take weeks. I mean, you'd go back and forth. I'm sure it's, you know, pretty, pretty typical. Um, and what we moved to were, you know, was basically we sat down with the same people, you know, but we really changed the way we thought of them. They weren't the customer anymore. They were our clinical partners. Um, so through this, this partnership, um, we learned their business better than, you know, an RFP or a, a business requirements document ever could. Uh, we sat down with them. We really got to know them. Um, and we started having these, you know, it would start off with a, a, probably a two-minute conversation. 
no, I think lab's a problem, or I think radiology is a problem, um, or I think, you know, this physician is, is taking too long, but they say they have the hardest cases. Like, can we see that? Um, and then we'd come back, and we'd sit down with them once we had the data. I don't, I don't want to undermine the importance of getting access to the data. So that file prepper thing, that, I mean, that lasted for a long time. Like, getting access to the data is tricky. Um, not just tricky, but it's critical. So making sure that the data is right. So that's why we're, we're really excited to hear some of the stuff that's, that's taking shape with, with uh, how Tableau will help us you know, prep that data. Um, but we'd sit out with them and go through a workshop where we'd, we'd show them you know, a couple visual analytics and let them kind of bounce ideas off us. And we'd pivot on the fly. And you know, it took probably about three minutes for them to get used to us actually working in the session. Uh, but once they could see the, the results, they'd, you know, oh, okay, so it's not that. It's, you know, what about this? And then you'd, you'd kind of drill down um, or drill through or across or up and down, whatever you need to do. Uh, but you'd find that answer as long as you had it in the data set. If it wasn't, we'd shelve it for next time, and we'd try to go acquire that data. Uh, but it allowed us to perform those analytics just in time as they were thinking about these things where, where leaders could, you know, gain that insight, ask new questions, and act on the data that they were seeing. And then they'd, they'd jot something down. They'd arrive at a conclusion. And, uh, and they were part of the solution at that point. It wasn't just something we were giving them. It was something that they helped form. Uh, so then we experienced Tableau. You know, <laughs> requests for analytics began pouring in. Th that's a term that we saw once, and it, and it never really caught on that we could see, but we thought it was appropriate. Um, you know, we started, leaders were coming to us, and they wanted to see similar um, transparency and comparative outcomes, uh, particularly uh, across physicians. Um, our, our structure, we report under, um, under quality. So we report up to our chief quality officer, who's a physician, um, in a dyad partnership with a, um, a director of nursing. Uh, that, that dyad partnership has been critical, the physician and nursing partnership. Uh, and what they wanted to see was basically how are physicians performing across a variety of metrics. So it led us down uh, a similar approach for OPP and FPP, the ongoing and focused uh, physician practice evaluation. Uh, so let me kind of show you where we're going now. And actually, it looks like I only have two minutes. I'll be very, 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 very quick. Um, so we, we saw this earlier, and we basically took the, that same, <coughs> excuse me, that same design and said, okay, let's look at physicians by specialty, you know, we'll, we'll create all these filters um, so we can look at it by attending, by surgeon, uh, by admitting if we need to, uh, and we came up with this thing called attributing, which is a, an algorithm that we have running in the background that basically helps us with attribution. Um, we can look at certain groups. We can look across a variety of specialties. We can look at hospitalists and exclude them if we need to. We can look at age groups. So if we want to see a Medicare 65 plus population to help normalize things, we can do that. If we want to exclude hospice patients, we can do that. Uh, we can also look at data going back a variety of, of periods. So we actually, this is based on claims data, and there's about four years of claims data in here. Uh, and then basically, Again, you can just see a given physician's performance on the spectrum of their peers defined by their specialty group. Um, the green lines, you can kind of see them. That represents you know, plus and minus one standard deviation just for a rough idea of if someone is outside of one. The reason we don't use two, if they're really outside of two, we should have caught it before. Uh, if they're performing that far out, we want to see and explore what was going on if they're outside of one, which means we're casting a, a broader net, but we found it to be, to be helpful in identifying things uh, or physicians that were just, just below the radar, so to speak. Um, from here, basically we made this available to our physician leaders. Uh, they could actually drill in and see patient detail. Uh, so each of these would have the, that drill capacity where they could actually see a list of their patients. Uh, hovering over the bar would show you a ton of information uh, about that patient in addition to you know, certain things that I can't show on here because of HIPAA, uh, patient numbers, things like that. Uh, but it allowed them to really see and believe the, the data, which has always been a problem. You give them a report, it's a piece of paper, and then they ask for a detail, and it takes three weeks to get the detail, and they've already moved on to six other things by that point. 
So with this being available, putting it in the hands of physician leaders, um, chiefs of surgery, you know, the, the lead hospitalist, things like that, getting them on board, they actually helped us build this. So again, they were our partners, they helped us build it. Uh, it was better than what they were getting before because they just had paper. And um, they were willing to sit down with their, um, you know, with, with, with their surgeons, with their doctors, and show them, um, you know, their performance. And again, physicians, the culture that, they, that a lot of them have come up through is inherently competitive, uh, so they'd want to be the best. Um, and I, I mean, I, I, I'm not a physician, but I work with a lot of them, and I play one on TV, so um, I know what I'm talking about. No, I'm just kidding. But a lot of them will say that you know, through med school, um, you know, they want the best, uh, you know, they want the best residents, or they want, you know, they want to get placed at the best, best location. So it's inherently competitive. But I don't want to go too too far into this. I just kind of want to show you, you know, where we're taking this next. And we've actually put together a list of about 150 metrics, different data sources that we're going to be using this type of report, which again they helped us build. So you know, it's. I don't, it, it works well. They, they like it. And it's metrics that they've helped identify as, as being pertinent to, um, to their particular services. And that's how we plan to, to really roll out you know, an enhanced level of, of OPP and FPP. So that's, that's kind of our story about how we're using Tableau, uh, both from an ED standpoint as kind of like an initial phase, and then also how it's helped us you know, really transform our culture and the way that our team and our, and our institution looks at, uh, looks at data. They can see it now. They don't just get reports. So thank you. Appreciate it. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, we, we use NextGen. OK, cool. OK, sure. Um, well, so-so, you know, if I was French, I'd say, come see, come saw. Um, they, so some of them like it. I mean, the ones that have, you know, taken, it, you're going to have your early adopters and your, your ones that just won't ever do it. And there are a set that just will never do it. And there's paper processes in place for them. It's basically like if the internet explodes, like that's what you go to. And that's the process that they use. So, um, there's, there's one doctor that has um, folders on a wall, and they just put their charts in the folders, and it's, that's what they do. It's not great, but they're, they're not going to change. Th this gentleman's older, and he's not, he doesn't want to change, and the you know, administration said, okay, we're not going to make you. So, yeah. Sure. So we're, we're not there yet. Um, so what, right now we have um, an ambulatory team, and basically we, we distribute right, well, okay. So last month um, for three or four main specialties, we sent PDFs of each individual physician's thing out to them, and we sat with the leaders. The PDFs were so they could hand someone paper because they like paper. But we sat down with the physician leaders and showed them the tool and gave them the tool via Tableau server. So that's, that's kind of how, actually I don't think they have server yet, they still have the client reader and a TWBX file in SharePoint. So we're still rolling out server right now. But eventually, you know, once we can get all the Active Directory stuff worked out, the idea would be to give them access to just their, their subset of the data. I don't know the, the, the technical nuance of how we're gonna do that yet, but that's the plan. Okay. Um, we haven't really explored online too, too much. Um, Tableau online? Yeah, we haven't looked at that very, very close. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, in the back? So, um, so we, we have the, the, the door into triage times by physician, 
And then from there, we can see the patients. I don't, Ray, have, I don't know what kind of analysis we've done or if that's been an issue that we've had to explore. Um, you know, that, um, the way I understand it, um, in our ER, um, the initial triage um, is done within minutes of them walking in. Um, and then there's a secondary triage that's performed by, um, by, by nursing and I believe like with a physician assistant or, or, or ARNP type role. Um, and, then the, and, and then typically the physician assigns himself and comes into the room. So um, I haven't really looked at triage, you know, it, there's no data that really ties that process to particular physicians, except I suppose if you wanted to um, like measure um, triage to physician assign um, to see how long they're waiting. But we usually look at um, room to physician assign, not the tri triage. No, to, so tri, tri, triage happens, then they're in an, an ED bed, then the physician typically assigns himself. So we usually look at the physicians. Um, we have scorecards built for all of the um, ED physicians so that the director um, who's responsible can, can go in um, and sit down with each individual ER doc and you know, look at those key time metrics um, with them to make sure that they're at least in line with all the rest of the ER docs. Um, and if they're not, you know, try to help come up with strategies or pair them maybe with another doctor um, so that you know, they can see how, how this guy's a able to do that. We're not an ACO. Uh, in terms of clinical pathways, I'm trying to think. That I don't, I'm trying to think. If there's anything on the roadmap for that right now? I'm not. I don't. I don't believe there is. Right now, we're. You know, our, our kind of the next things we're attacking. You know, age caps, the patient experience, uh, as well as some of the measures we saw in here with with risk-adjusted mortality, uh, risk-adjusted complications, 30-day readmission rates. Um, obviously, you know, core measure failures. We we have a pretty robust process around. Uh, patient safety indicators right now, um, concurrent review, that type of stuff. Um, but in terms of the pathways, I don't think we're, we're there yet. The other one, you know, severity adjusted length of stay, you know, we, we really want to make sure th those measures are, are kind of our, our focus at this point. So in the, the pathways, I think, will we'll be a part of, especially for the length of stay and for the, for the readmission piece, I'm, I'm guessing that will come into play at some point. But Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So from a triage standpoint? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if we've looked at that very closely. I know um, from, from a documentation standpoint, I know like the, you know, the reason for visit is a free text field the way we're doing it today. Uh, we've talked about maybe putting some constraints around that. In terms of the admit diagnosis, I mean, th so that's going to be after they go through triage and after the physician has, you know, had all their information. But I don't, we'll take a look. So I appreciate the tip. Yeah. So now we have uh, a separate data warehouse team. We don't report up to IT, but in IT there's, there's a data warehouse team that is, is partnered with, with Cerner uh, to get access to basically uh, 
a, a, like a secondary copy, if you will, of, of, their, of their primary database that we can connect to and that acts as the source for their data warehouse. So that makes our lives a lot easier. We're, we're just uh, at the point where we're getting access to that now. Uh, and that's how we're, we've been able to help automate a lot of these things that historically, you know, we've, we've amassed text files. So <laughs> we've, had, we've had access to th some data all along. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's a journey. You know, there, there was no EDW back no, then. No, I understand. So I'm just not surprised. <laughs> it's getting access to the data uh, is, is tricky, especially when, when you're in an environment where security is, is so critical. So it's been that finding the right balance of securing the data and leveraging the data and making sure we have a champion that really wants to, to leverage the data. And we've been lucky that we've had that in our, our chief quality officer. And, and I mean, the security stuff, I can't, I mean, it, it's critical. Uh, but, you know, there are certain, certain times when certain roles need access to the data to do their jobs. And that's kind of the angle that we've been playing is, you know, in order to do our jobs, we need unfettered access to data so we can turn it into action. So, yeah, three years. <laughs> so, well, again, I thank you guys for, for being here. It's, you know, it's been a pleasure.